Hi, and welcome everybody to our third collective session that is focusing on the meetings and events industry. Uh, we call that the Collective My Speed. It's the third session. And thank you, everyone, for joining us, tuning in. It's great to have you. Stay with us for the next 45 to 60 minutes. It's going to be great. We have great guests joining. And also make sure to say hi in the comment section. Let us know from where you're tuning in. And if you feel that adds value to your community as well, make sure to share this post so we get more people involved, the more the merrier, I'd say. And this series here, the MySpeed series, is a series we are co-hosting and creating together with our friends at Great Hotels of the World, which is a leading representation company for upscale luxury hotels and also one of our founding members here at Tech Talk Travel. My name is Leah Jordan. I'm co-founder of Tech Talk Travel, and I'm super excited for the next 45 minutes with all of you to discuss uh, a very interesting topic we'll introduce in a moment. But first, I introduce to you Rita my fabulous co-host, Rita Machado. <laughs> Hi, Rita. Hello, everyone. Hi, Leah. Lovely to be here again. Yes, good to see you. Are you good? Ready for the yes. first All good. Getting ready. Getting ready for Q4. Perfect. And Rita, for everyone, is uh, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Great Hotels of the World, and um, she's in the driver's seat regarding the topics we're discussing here. And I can tell you the topic today is very interesting because we're discussing uh, one of my favorite topics. We talk about food and beverage, which is very nice, but we talk about it in relation to meetings and events and also technology. And we want to look into opportunities and challenges uh, in tomorrow's events environment, what's going on there and what we should prepare for. And we have great guests joining. And before we introduce them, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items so we make the best out of the next 45 to 60 minutes together here. So we are currently streaming live on LinkedIn and YouTube. And you can take part of this discussion. You just join us with your thoughts and perspectives. Make sure to also share your opinions with us in the comments section. If there's something you want to direct to a specific person in our panel, then make sure to tag that person so we can also follow up later on. The same goes for questions and we will make sure to cover them in our discussion and to include it. So um, that's very um, interesting for us because we never really know what, what direction the discussion is going to take depending on what are you contributing from the audience. And also just for everyone who's joining us now and wants to revisit maybe the session later on, we will provide it later on as an on-demand session, as podcasts and video on all channels on Tech Talk Travel and also Great Hotels of the World. So make sure to follow them and their channels to stay up to date. And other than that, I think we're ready to go. It's the third time, so we are professionals by now in the MySpeed um, environment. Uh, let's dive right into it, into it and let's get the panelists into picture. We have three great experts joining being passionate around the food and beverage topic. And I'll kick off with Isabel, Isabel Steinhauer. Good afternoon, Hi. everyone. Hi, Isabel. Isabel is joining us from Amsterdam, the beautiful Netherlands, and she's director of food and beverage at the beautiful hotel Okura, very famous and also a member of the great hotels of the world, right? Correct, yes. Correct. And you've been in food and beverage like since 2009, so that's quite some years. I think uh, you know a bit about it. And some, one of your former stations is, uh, for example, the beautiful Ritz Carlton here in Berlin. And about your hotel Okura, um, for everyone who doesn't know that, it's a, it's, it's a very Spanish hotel, a luxury hotel, and it's... Um, is of the art of Japanese service. They have four restaurants. Um, two of them are Japanese cuisine and they hold three Michelin stars. And you even have one with a Bib Gourmand. And I'd say it's a very interesting uh, property to hear from, right? And then we have um, from Spain tuning in, we have Angelo Vasallo, um, the director of food and beverage at the firm in Barcelona, Rey Juan Carlos Primero. Hi, Angelo. Hi, Hi Leo. How are you? Hi, everybody. Yes, I'm ready and great that you're joining us. And um, to also give a bit of context here, it's a beautiful hotel, the Fairmont Rey Juan Carlos, but it's currently closed. Um, you reopened during summer 2020, right? And it was a successful season for you guys, but then you closed again in November. So, and you're looking forward to opening up again, fingers crossed. Um, but in the meanwhile, um, in May, you were part of a task force um, within the Accor for the opening of the first SO hotel in Spain that is also the Grande, right? And right. they were in charge of mainly the preparation of opening the F&B departments, which includes, for example, the introduction of the standards, SOPs, etc. So I think, um, yeah, you have some something to share with us to introduce <laughs> something like that in a time like today. It's uh, probably very interesting. I will, I will. Thank you. 
Yeah, very good. And then the third one in the group today joining us is from the technology side. So uh, we have that perspective too. It's Michael Madison. Michael, yes. Hi, everybody. Hi. You're tuning in from France. That's right. That's right, yeah. That's right, yeah. Bonjour. <laughs> Welcome. Great to be joining us. And uh, Michael is representing Minomoto. He is founder and CEO. It's a, a menu CMS and display tool that's designed to make online presentation of food and beverage offering um, easy and effective for restaurants or hotels or anyone having an F&B operation. And I'd say you're on a mission against online PDFs. Is that right, Michael? <laughs> That's part of it, yes. <laughs> part of it, okay. Yeah, we will we will probably touch that topic later on as well. And yeah, you're all about migrating your customers full of digital, digital to have a responsive, interactive and smart menus. So it's interesting to have your perspective with us here as well. And um, I think it's a good group to start off, but Rita is in the driver's seat. So I know we have an endless list of interesting topics. What's the first one we can have? Right. Thank you, Leah. Yes, we have um, an endless list of topics, so let's focus on the main ones. Otherwise, we'll be here till dinner. Um, the first the first topic I'd like to discuss um, with all of you is um, clearly that F&B offering has become even more important um, within a hotel. Uh, if you don't, um, if you can't sell rooms or meeting rooms, most of us have pivoted with our restaurants and they've really shone um, as a differentiator for today's customer. Um, and with them, we've realized that we're living in a paradox. We have people talking about the need for human interaction, the human experience um, in, a, in a restaurant. And at the same time, here we are all talking about technology um, and how that can help us pivot in today's world. So I just like to launch that, throw this at you. Um, Isabel, maybe to start off with, how in the Okura Amsterdam, um, you felt over the last year or so, these two forces working together and um, at the same time, really, technology and people. Well, uh, Rita, it's been a challenging and interesting time. And more than ever did we realize that uh, this year, Okura is celebrating its 50 years anniversary, that it did pay off to already build years ago on the local clientele, at least when it comes to the restaurant part, um, we were able to really uh, differentiate ourselves uh, on being there uh, for our guests, even when the restaurants were closed, uh, closed due to the COVID uh, and the pandemic. Um, we would be trying to reach out to our guests uh, via master classes. I give you one example, a beautiful time that we had uh, when of uh, one of uh, our executive chefs uh, did a sushi masterclass for our guests at home. So we're really trying to connect as well there on the local side and uh, with also international clientele. But yeah, the true focus was really uh, on the locals and to be authentic, personalized, and that really made a difference. And now that the restaurants are open back again uh, after second uh, lockdown since the 1st of June, um, we see our guests, they really missed us, regardless of the connection that we try to build within. Um, they really are dying to come back to, to experience the product and to experience that experience. Because at the end of the day, as you said, Rita, it's all about the human interaction that really counts. Um, mm -hmm. Technology, uh, I think we come back to that uh, in a second, maybe. Um, yeah. How much does it add value, actually? because in some areas it does add value and, and in others you can never substitute that human part. Yeah, right, absolutely. Michael, how do you see technology helping restaurants and, and hotel restaurants at this moment in time? Because well, clearly there's an upside. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, we started out um, a number of years ago with Mediamoto and we really focused on helping hotels drive business into, into their restaurants, provide information, about their F and B outlets, that was kind of in sync with their with the quality of the, the the overall product. Luxury hotels very often did not have any menus at all on their websites, uh, or they had multiple PDFs. And so we developed a system that made that better. Now the pandemic changed the focus, obviously. First of all, because they were closed for a long time in many places around the world, 
Um, and secondly, because then it was all about how do we handle business? We have local regulations, we have expectations, we've got sanitary uh, uh, concerns, we, we can't touch menus, so we have to have an alternative. So we jumped into that space, not because we are, or because I am convinced that that is the future, or that that is the solution for everybody. Definitely for two-star restaurants at the Okura, it's unlikely to be to be a solution or that that goes way into the future because that, that that's where you talk about the quality of the product the experience uh, the, the 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 advice you get from this from knowledgeable staff and all of those things so there's much more to it but we had to do it so it's an add-on to our to to our solution um, mm -hmm. and um, we decided not to go all the way so we don't have an ordering system where you order and you pay and do all those things they exist and they're very valuable in certain environments um, but we really focused on them um, providing quality navigation pro pro um, uh, quality displays of menus that could work as an alternative to paper right? mm -hmm. is that going to last who knows right so i, I think there, there there are split opinions about that i don't have this you know crystal ball that looks mm -hmm. into the future um, there's some cost savings involved in using technology like that, but I think in the long term, and we see a shift now again, a kind of light at the end of the tunnel, um, that uh, customers are uh, looking at the future, looking at driving business. So as um, uh, as travel returns, uh, and also as they have, you mentioned before, discovered the value of local business, that's why they have to behave more like local restaurants. And right. a local restaurant with their website, they have their menu on the website. And it looks pretty good in most cases. So that's what's driving a lot of what's uh, what, what in the thinking of hotels right now. Mm -hmm. oh, Angela, when you when you worked on your task force at the So Hotel this summer, or uh, this year, at least since May, I think it was, mm -hmm. how did technology come into the equation, if it did at all? Yes, it did. It did. Uh, and uh, in this case, in the question, it, uh, it was, uh, let's say, to have a look at which kind of a process you can uh, digitalize in order to be more attentive on the human touch afterwards. I mean, to concentrate yourself on what is adding really value in the interaction with the guest and maybe digitalize what is not really so important or adding value at the end of the day. Um, with Michael, we really work it together with, uh, with the Fairmont. We work as well together in the Sosoto Grande. And for me, the digitalization of the menu for, uh, as well in the Sosoto Grande was really important because at the end of the day, you can adjust your menu according to what you have during the day. You don't need to print it again. You can, if you have high business, maybe you can focus on what is really uh, faster to produce from, from uh, your kitchen. And, uh, and regarding the Soto Grande, what we did as well was a digital ordering for uh, room service. Um, mm -hmm. Taking into consideration that the Soto Grande is a resort and uh, is, uh, let's say, is uh, developing itself in horizontal. It's not like a, a normal hotel, which is vertical. So you need a lot of time to deliver the food to the room. So which means that if you digitalize a part of the digital ordering, you can gain time on uh, spend more uh, time with the guests when delivering the food. And the same we did as well for uh, for the pool. There's a, magnific a magnificent pool uh, in uh, in the restaurant called ISO. And uh, we decided as well to introduce the digital order ordering from the pool itself. So you don't need to wait for the waiting staff coming to the pool. You can just order your nice cold beer or a bottle of champagne by the pool, digital ordering coming to the desk of the bar, and then we will deliver to your uh, sunbed. So it's something that uh, it's easy to use for uh, for uh, for the guests. It's easy to use as well for uh, for the staff. It's making the interaction a little bit uh, faster than, uh, than initially, but it's not missing the human touch. I mean, the people around the pool will always take order if needed, but you can speed up and you can make it even more, let's say, um, interesting with the digital order right absolutely okay um one of the things we we also discussed was um how visual all of this is becoming and um online menus and michael was telling us how menu modo is integrating with social media for the feed so um people are a lot more open to uh, you know pictures of dishes even you know i was looking at the huayol monso one of menu modo's clients and and their you know very upscale restaurant has pictures of their signature dishes now this is something that works online and i can't imagine this working in print um i just don't see how this would work in print in an upscale restaurant but there is no there's no doubt to me that our generation certainly the generation below us 
is a lot more visual and they react to visual communication. Do you think this is a trend that's going to um, carry on or do you think this will backtrack into only text menus? I think uh, looking at uh, the luxurious segment and the authenticity of a J two Japanese restaurants here, an international two Michelin star restaurant, uh, Rita, yeah, the visualization of a printed dish on a menu, uh, <laughs> I found that a bit awkward. And yeah. looking to Angelo and the concept of beach places, pool places, I think one size doesn't fit all. So. It, it does make a lot of uh, sense to uh, utilize those pictures and visual, uh, visuals in some of the areas and, and others, you may want to lead to it. I could also yeah. say that for in-room dining, I think this is a way forward for the longer term because it's an easier way to communicate. Uh, people don't want to pick up the phone. They, they want to see a little bit more the outcome, what to expect. So. Once again, I think it totally depends on the concept of the restaurant. It uh, mm -hmm. depends on the location where you are. So um, I'm, I'm really looking forward also to develop our in-room dining offerings more towards easily more approachable uh, and pictures there could really truly make yeah, sense. Absolutely, yeah. Michael, have you seen pi pictures being um, a feature of anyone, any one of your clients? Well, yes, uh, it varies. It varies significantly by by region of the world. I mean, in Asia, pictures are are required. I mean, in China and and and, and um, Thailand and Indonesia, if you have a digital menu without photos, it doesn't really look very good. It's not perceived as valuable. So, their photos are really important. Um, I mean. I, I agree. It, for for a starred restaurant, it's, it, it is not it is not really essential to have the photos or not good to have the photos on the menu. However, it is more used. And you mentioned the YM also. The, me, the the photos there are not in the menus, right? And the menus they use in the restaurant, even with the, with the QR code, they don't have photos in them. Yeah. But they use it to create an atmosphere to help uh, guests decide on their restaurants and to understand what they can what they can expect there. Uh, and it's not only for the restaurants, but on hotel websites as well. It actually helps people take a decision to stay in a hotel or not. I mean, if you imagine now, city restaurants may be a little bit different. But if I go to if I go to the Maldives, let's take an example, and I've got a choice between between three or four luxury hotels that kind of fit into my price range. I'm traveling with my family. Uh, I need food well that I like, that my wife likes, and that my children like. Right? I'm likely to actually look at the menus, right? And that's where we see we see a tremendous number of views to menus on the restaurant's websites, on the hotel website, sorry, um, for all types of, for all types of uh, hotels. And so there is some, some evidence or some feeling that it actually helps people to take a decision where they're going to be staying. Absolutely. It's not only about the, about the food. In the end, it is, obviously. But it, it, it helps round out the picture uh, just as you have really nice photos of the rooms now and not just one, you might even have a 360 degree tour uh, suites, you might have a floor plan to really let people understand what it's all about. Um, and and, and uh, the food images obviously contribute to that. Yeah. Um, also, we, we, we did discuss this as well, how, how dynamic menu pricing is being helped by technology. Um, Angelo mentioned actually menu re-engineering um, I just like to throw at you when you have um, sustainability as one of the core concepts today in today's consumer and sourcing local products, fresh produce, clearly an opportunity for restaurants and groups menus to show off how far along they are. But um, do you, especially um, Isabel and Angelo, do you see that there's a financial interest as well on the profit side for your restaurants? in menu engineering, you know, helped by technology, helped by an online menu, because you clearly can't change um, traditional menus, you know, every day or every two days, according to what comes in your basket. Yeah, I mean, uh, regarding, uh, especially the one working for a uh, big hotel chain, we know that we have uh, really high standards in printing menus. So I remember the last time that I printed my room service menu, which was really, uh, let's say, focus on uh, respecting the standard. It was really a huge uh, investment for us. 
And now thinking that you can uh, just uh, change it every day, just uh, in a digital menu, it makes a lot of space in terms of financials. And uh, you can change it to the arranging uh, uh, seasonally, uh, depends from the guests staying at the hotel. For example, if it's a Arabian season, you can arrange it for the Arabian people staying in the hotel. You can arrange, for example, speaking about the Fermo de Carlos I, when we have uh, Barcelona playing against Madrid, you have a so big volume of people coming to the hotel that maybe you want to focus in uh, food, which is pretty easy for the kitchen to prepare. And then you can just add some items on your menu, which you could not do with uh, a standard menu, which was uh, printed before. And of course, in terms of uh, menu engineering, we, was, we were uh, speaking about this as well earlier. Of course, in this day that when I'm uh, expecting a really high volume of business, maybe I can focus on the more profitable items that they have in the menu. And I can just uh, place them differently so that uh, in marketing strategy, then they will be the first choice for our, for our guests. I could not do this for a printed menu because otherwise I'll need to spend a lot of time to print it in the simple case, or a lot of time to fight with my financial manager. And, oh, I need to reprint again a menu for marketing <laughs> settings. Say, come on, guys, uh, you need to budget it before. So <laughs> it will be it will be a long, a long challenge. So I think that digitalization for me in terms of menu is helping a lot in menu engineering. Is helping a lot, as you said, in the revenue management as well. Because uh, actually, if you can change the item, you can as well change the price if you wish. And in terms of sustainability, I mean, we are we are seeing a lot of menu with the uh, soup of the day, catch of the day, but uh, everyone is not specifying what is a uh, catch of the day or <laughs> soup of the day. With a digital yeah. menu, you go over there and you can uh, specify it in, uh, in, uh, in one second. And, uh, Michael yeah. can confirm it with the menu mode as well. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty easy. So I see a lot of potential over there. And I have to be honest, not only for, uh, um, let's say, mid-scale or just upscale uh, uh, restaurant, I see as well for uh, luxury restaurant that can as well uh, uh, benefits from it. Um, I had recently in Madrid an experience in a gastronomic restaurant which was not using digital menu and uh, the menu was outdated. We ordered eight different items of the eight, 50% of them were out of stock. So with the digital yeah. menu, you can just take them off. Of course, the waiter should be aware of this and communicate to the guests, but you can help your, uh, your staff doing it digitally if you wish. So. I mean, it depends always from the concept, but I see uh, the digital menu for me as a great help for customer service, for revenue management, and of course, in terms of sustainability as well. Yeah, yeah. interesting. And also, yeah. In, in terms of efficiency, um, looking at the number of colleagues having to distribute, I mean, the Okura has 300 rooms. Uh, with all the uh, changes, flexibility, it's also very efficient to make small changes, act accordingly uh, price-wise, but also from the content. So it does have a lot of benefits in, in the room service part. Um, and coming back to the restaurants, I think looking at digitalization, uh, using of QR codes, again, it, it does help a lot in some areas. And it's something that here and there people have started to really miss the the old normal, new normal with a paper printed menu or an open menu that they can have, someone explaining the dishes, doing the exact wine pairing next to it. Yeah, I mean, that's also part of the experience, right, that we touch upon a bit later, I guess. Yeah. Um, we have a question from the audience, um, Petro Kolako, who's joining us um, from Lisbon. He's, um, it's a question that's not related now to technology, but he's interested in hearing from you guys um, how much the local traffic is versus guests now at your restaurant, how it has changed, and what do you expect to see in the future in terms of your guest profiles, if you are able to forecast that a bit. Well, how do we start? Isabel, you want to start with your Amsterdam experience? Yeah, the local uh, footfall has been very high. I would say it's like the sort of the 80-20, which has been there in the past. And that really helped us a lot to, to stay in touch with our guests also uh, when the restaurants were able to reopen again. So that local focus, building those long-term relationships, this is so essential and it helped us uh, a lot to stay in touch with our guests through the closure, but it also does now. And today, I mean, uh, on Monday, we had the first conference ever. I mean, I'm talking now 138 uh, attendees, which is big <laughs> when previously you talk about 800. But this is also uh, 
uh, guests who actually like to spread out in little groups in the evening to dine with us. So it's it's essential to have hotel guests joining, conference guests joining. Uh, but I would say it's overall at eighty twenty, and I see that also in the future that people want to spend that time together, networking, having common dinners together, uh, whilst you can convert a meeting room, of course, completely different by allowing yourself two to three hours of, of turn and turn that all, whole room into entire uh, dinner venue. You don't have to go into different restaurants. You can just utilize the fact and, and convert the room into something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Angelo, how was your experience? Because you said your summer season was very good, actually. So did, did you, did, was there a change in the actual like profile of guests coming to your restaurants? Well, it was a change that uh, it was already occurring in the past, even if in a different form, okay? Because uh, we have a different uh, restaurant in the Fairmont, and uh, there's one of them which was historically a good restaurant for local people. For example, in uh, the season 2019, we actually had a business mix of 54% guest uh, local market, so no resident, and uh, the 46% uh, from in-house guests. So the restaurant was really well known in, uh, in the local community. Of course, during the COVID season, uh, the percentage was uh, completely uh, for the local uh, local people. We had uh, more or less uh, more than 90% of the people coming to it into the restaurant, which were people resident of Barcelona and not sleeping, uh, sleeping at the town. And uh, I saw as well the interest of... Uh, local people going for uh, for hotel restaurant uh, when it was in Soto Grande, because even if uh, we were not open yet, we did have a lot of requests of people around the area for uh, coming to dine to, to to the hotel. So I think that uh, the one of the, let's say, positive side of uh, the pandemic was to make even closer the hotel with the local community, uh, because at the end of the day, there was no really other opportunity to travel around. So it was a uh, sort as well uh, to escape from the normal routine uh, that you have in the city. And it was as well uh, for a um, city like uh, Barcelona and other overcrowded, over tourist city to get more closer to this uh, community to show them that we are here as well for them. So we are not just for tourists, we are as well for the local community and we are as well ambassador of the local community. So for me, the FMB uh, FMB department is like an ambassador of the destination to the external guests as well as as a representative for the people uh, staying in uh, in Barcelona. But anyway, yeah, I see a lot of uh, change of uh, more interest from local residents to the hotel restaurant. And it's good because uh, as we say always, uh, the re hotel restaurant uh, at the end of the day is just uh, a restaurant which has uh, the benefit to have hotel guests sleeping in the hotel. But at the end of the day, it's a normal restaurant. There's other restaurant in uh, uh, in the city. It's just uh, up to us to make it relevant as well for the local community with the relevant uh, uh, gastronomic and experience. Yeah. Okay. Right. There's another question and that is tapping back into the topic that we just had with digital menus and also a bit, Isabel, you, you told us also in the conversation we had beforehand right, with the QR codes that your guests, for example, they just don't want that anymore. So there was a period where they adopted that well because of the, the pandemic and now they're, wanting, they're really expecting you to offer the the high class like printed menus. So Felipe Santiago is joining us as well. Hi Felipe, thank you for joining us. And he's asking the group, um, why do you think there is no significant migration from physical to digital menus? And um, do you think that the pandemic experience will boost maybe the rising trend of digital menus? And if so, to what extent? Um, yeah, Isabel, maybe you, you start because you, you already shared something with us, right? The observation that there that wasn't really sustainable, the introduction of QR codes, for example. Well, the QR codes uh, are very successful uh, when it comes to room service. Mm -hmm. uh, and indeed, uh, in the restaurant itself, people uh, were looking uh, again to 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 touch something to to look at something to be explained uh to be given some advice so overall it is really um yeah from my point of view something that people are a little bit sick and tired it doesn't fit the concept and it is very ideal to use it and it works very well uh if we do use it in room service mm -hmm. so there's two-way streets uh, again, I'm repeating myself, one, one size yeah. doesn't fit all here. And uh, to, to answer Philippe's question, I think, where does the trend go? I think 
it is extremely helpful. It's extremely valuable to utilize it in, in certain concepts of outdoor location, uh, restaurants which are situated outdoors, pool restaurant, beaches. I think outside Amsterdam, 30 minutes from here, we have wonderful beaches around. And if I go outside to, to dine there in private, I really take advantage of that QR code. It works. It lets you look at visuals of printed uh, menus, uh, uh, sorry, uh, visuals that you would see. Uh, you can have the waiter uh, not even having to approach your table. You can have a very fast and efficient service there. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it really depends on which concept yeah. you are looking for. Yeah. Michael, um, could, we, could we hear from Michael on this? Because with over, I don't know, 2,000 clients, you, you've got some experience on you know on the the challenges that restaurants and hotels face on implementing any technology well i think <clears throat> i mean it, it is, i think we're we're saying there's no there's no one size fits all solution and the requirements vary uh, say in a two star restaurant and i go there for the experience and for the food and yeah i like touching menus and i've been starting to to eat out again recently, and I haven't had one restaurant with QR codes, whether it was in Switzerland, Germany, uh, or France. I always get paper. Um, so I, I think it depends. I mean, the technology is there. Um, and um, I mean, our, our hotel customers uh, surprise us, some surprises, because we in some in some of the big hotels, we, we see a tremendous number of use to the QR codes, and in others, not at all. It's simply not used. Um, so it is. There's, there's no clear. There's no clear answer. On that. I think that I mean, there, in the beginning there was so much uncertainty about the whole pandemic and how do I catch this thing? Do I catch it from touching something? And well, everybody's <laughs> built their own their own ways of coping with that. I think the the, the one challenge, and we talked about it in a previous conversation, was uh, the expectations of, of, of not just diners, local diners, but travelers. So I come from a country where I am used to having QR codes. I go to a place where, well, I might expect it there as well, because, well, I'm, it's, you know, it's my comfort zone and I've built my rules uh, for based on the past 18 months that I've gone through in my environment. Are we going to have to provide it? Or have we, do we have, are we going to end up having QR codes as a backup instead of having paper menus as backup? I, 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 can't, I, I can't predict that. I, I, think, I think everybody will just have to be flexible and that's, um, well, that's what we're doing with our technology. It's there, and for our subscribers, for our customers, if they want to use it, they do, and some do, and some don't. Yeah. But it's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, I, do, I do have some uh, a question again about how far do you think uh, technology and online menus um, will actually be used in banqueting and groups for MICE business? Clearly, MICE business, especially international, um, is... If you've ever received a group request, you have PDFs thrown at you, um, and you have seven or eight PDFs thrown at you in, in one email, plus a couple more in Skype, and a couple more in WhatsApp, and a couple more in Slack if you use it, and you get drowned in PDFs. Um, and Angelo is laughing, so he's already seen group coordinators sending out PDFs. Um, <laughs> Do you think they will come to an end? Is is Michael's war on PDFs going to be won in the groups department as well? Um, can you see a can you see a day when you're going to be doing an online menu specifically for each client um, in your in your groups department? Do you see what I mean? And maybe update it every month until the group comes in with your local, you know, catch of the day or whatever. Do you think that's going to happen, or or am I dreaming? Well, it's happening already. I mean, it depends always from the request that you receive and how you can personalize it. I mean, uh, I, I recall one German big client that uh, we have uh, every year in June coming. And uh, when he's coming, his uh, request, we know that uh, there is no menu that we have in our banquet folder that it could be sent because it needs to be personalized. It needs to be everything new, everything local and uh, out of the box. So it will be a personalized menu 100%. Anyway, back to the, um, the topic. I think that uh, a digital menu as well in Banquet can help a lot. I will give you another example. Um, as, as I said, I work a lot with the menu model with Michael, and uh, I love 
in, uh, in the application that he has, uh, the possibility to, uh, let's say, sort or to filter the menu according to the diet of, uh, of the client. So now imagine that uh, you have a big group and you have the menu that we sent to you and you just give the QR code to the delegates and they can sort the menu that uh, they have in the buffet or just the menu that will be served according to the, the, their diets. So they can just, uh, having a look just at the moment, what they can eat and what they cannot eat, or they need to be adapted. In terms of quotation, of course, you can do a digital menu if you wish, then let the, the guests filter it as a, according to what he needs exactly for, for the group coming to the hotel. I mean, just to, to switch, let's say, the mentality or uh, uh, the feeling that we have at the moment with the menu, we think that the banquet menu is something static. They are not. They need to be dynamic. Dynamic, not just in sense of uh, pricing, but of course in sense of uh, uh, season, in sense of uh, delegates coming to the hotel, in sense of the request, budgeting, and so, and so on. And I think the digital menu, of course, is uh, is there to help as well with uh, this kind of challenge. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Simon Dowell, personalization, absolutely, and consistent throughout the group. Yes, and event <laughs> inquiry handling process, absolutely. Yeah. Um, does does anyone want to comment about uh, technology and hybrid events? How they're going to move forwards? Are we going to carry on organizing two events instead of one? Um, how challenging is that? And how can technology help us um, in that sense as well? Because clearly, we're all being thrown um, clients with very specific needs for hybrid events. Um, we're not seeing them ending anytime soon. Um, although, as Isabel was saying, because the events are smaller, um, we're celebrating 138 people like there's no tomorrow. But what are we going to do with hybrid events and technology in, in F&B? How do you see them uh, moving forwards? And um, Isabel, I believe you've already organized one or two hybrid events. In well, with, with hybrid events, it, it does reach some kind of complexity. Uh, overall, it's not only that it is workable and doable on site, which technology wise, you can be very well prepared, very well set. Uh, the other side which comes into place is the client who sits somewhere in the world to connect him or herself uh, to that hybrid meeting, which not everyone is a tech expert. So that's a little bit of a challenge. And I think what we also should face is that they will never disappear. But end of the day, there's a lot of things, as we all know, they don't happen online. They don't happen on Teams, on Zoom, or uh, any other uh, tool that we use to connect with ourselves. We want to meet. Uh, we want to see each other. We want to do networking. Um, the greatest decisions are taken when we see each other, when we get to know each other. Do you have kids? How do they are doing? And yeah, it, it just doesn't happen hybrid. So I think there will be both and it really depends completely on what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and of course, will anyone admit that all of this may cost a lot more, um, whether our clients are prepared to pay for this or not? Because clearly when you're putting together a hybrid event, you, you need different technology, more technology. Of course, you may be able to spread out the cost among more delegates, but it is a different it's a different event that's going on so um i think we've still all got a lot to learn certainly at great hotels of the world we've been talking to our own hotel members and uh, the actual experience of holding hybrid events is relatively new within a hotel and in very specific cases of clients who really need to do that event whatever happens and and you know and at the same time budgets realistically aren't brilliant but at this moment, everyone is prepared to risk it um, to be able to win any business. However, that's I don't think it's sustainable in the midterm, certainly not at today's uh, rates. So um, I'm glad to hear that it's a real challenge, not just us. Um, and we also mentioned the limited capacity and the financial stretch, right? So this requires very quick turnarounds because um, events change daily from the minute you get the first request until it actually happens. They're changing very, very quickly and we need to pivot quickly. Do you think that um, online technology just in general will help your teams to have less back and forth 
Um, is this something that that's an issue right now or maybe there isn't all that much business so we're all fine with the teams we have? Do we, do we feel we can handle this? I've, I'm, just, I'm talking to a venue in the UK at the moment because we're holding an event in November and this venue is swamped, swamped with requests from the domestic market. They are taking longer than usual to answer any type of proposal. Their teams have been obviously cut. They're now trying to rehire, um, no staff available. And, and the reality is they are sending proposals and menus as they probably were two or three years ago. Again, the emails and the PDFs back and forth. Um, do you think this will change anytime soon? Um, Angelo, did you have any experience in the So Soto Grande? Unfortunately, I don't have any experience with the software or technology helping us to be a little bit more effective on this. I mean, I know that we can, uh, let's say, organizing a little bit better our uh, internal process, but I don't know any software or something that which can help us to have, you know, a sort of automati automatization of the process in order to be faster uh, with, uh, with this. Otherwise, as you said, maybe you will send the classical uh, banquet menu, which is not really relevant for, uh, for this event. But I think that uh, with uh, what we move forward in uh, FMB in general in uh, technology and uh, combining it with the banquet world, with the events world, I think that uh, we can uh, uh, maybe slower than the restaurants, but uh, as well uh, in, uh, in the mice market, we can uh, move a little bit more in the automatization of the process and make it a little bit faster. Because as you say, the, now you're receiving a lot of requests Maybe you spend more time in qualifying them because uh, honestly, there are a lot of requests that uh, are not really relevant for uh, for your hotel, yeah. or maybe uh, you get the same. You we had it in the past, but now it seems to be a little bit uh, even stronger than the past. You have the same uh, quotation uh, divided in uh, sources, different sources. At the end of the day, you will uh, uh, realize that it was the same. So you are spending a lot of time on the same uh, on the same events. Um, so maybe it's just invest more time at the moment in qualifying the events and then make sure that you are going to reply fast to the ones which are really relevant business for, uh, yeah. for your company. I know that uh, the instruction at the moment is uh, uh, get everything in the market which is available, but maybe qualifying is always there to be a good tool to make sure that what you get is really relevant for your hotel. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very time consuming, Rita. Um, to, in many cases, send at the moment two proposals. One is there, how many people can we accommodate at your uh, facility? And if we can't <laughs> accommodate 400 persons, how can we connect 200 hybrid and the other 200 person have a dinner? And how can you maybe have the chef explaining a menu where those 200 which are not on site can enjoy some kind of food at home. I mean, it's it's really like thinking out of the box, but it's time consuming. And uh, yeah, it's it's good to know that potentially, hopefully in the upcoming weeks or so, uh, we can have the opportunity to not having to align anymore to the 1.5 meter regulations, which are very strict right now still in the Netherlands. So we can increase capacities again, because mm -hmm. that would also help our sales team um, to, to, to react quicker, even faster. And again, it's, it's all about personalization. I mean, when we had the hotel close, we did online site inspections. Um, so our sales team would really go through the, uh, closed hotel rooms. Um, we would have some colleagues here on site and, and even bring the chef with himself into the picture and, um, there's a lot of things to do this online as well, yeah. to just be there and be in touch. But it's yes. very time consuming. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, anything else you want to uh, discuss here? Um, any of uh, Angelo, Michael or Isabel, anything we haven't covered yet from our talking points? Because we did go, we did go overboard preparing this and we've had to pare it down. Um, I think... The only, the only issue we've, we haven't discussed is private celebrations um, with, you know, personal events, families celebrating, etc. small groups, which nowadays, you know, we're, we're looking at in all our hotels. But at the same time, we're dealing with non-professional organizers. So, again, hugely time-consuming. 
um, and, and requiring a very fast turnaround from our teams. Um, whereas a more professional event organizer would probably um, be a bit quicker uh, sending, sending things through. Have you, have you felt any of this in, in recent months? Um, in your hotels, have you seen an increase in private celebrations and groups and events? The, the requests have been coming through and sometimes you would, when we were able to do so, which has only been a few weeks from now, um, we, we simply had to deny some of the requests because uh, capacities didn't allow. Um, if you do go by the strict regulations in the Netherlands, uh, if if there's people from different households, you still have to sit down whilst you're consuming food and beverages. Um, so that's what a convention at this moment looks like. It's not like the networking. Uh, we are 100 people and we network together with drinks, just being very close to each other. This is not yeah. allowed as of the moment. Yeah. So, of course. Well, and, it's, and, and, you know, it's one of the trends for next year is all this social distancing, how you can make this happen in your hotel in an event and at the same time, provide an experience, you know, without people feeling lost in a room. Before, an, em an empty room was seen as very negative, and now it's just a necessity. And um, we've seen many of our hotels create little islands um, of things happening, interactivity, because people can't network one-to-one -one anymore. They have to network around something um, tangible and maintaining distances. So, you know, it's a real challenge with the current capacity levels. Um, so uh, it's, it's a real challenge to keep, to keep these events going. Um, also the service, I think we've all seen this, the type of service in our food and beverage outlets changing into a more personal service because we're not allowed um, mass buffets anymore in most countries. So you have to have teams serving your delegates, right? And that allows for interaction, of course, um, but it doesn't allow people to help themselves as they did before. And, you know, and the big question is, of course, how much does all this cost? Because you then have, yeah, uh, Angelo is raising his eyebrows because of course it's not the same price, you know, when you have all the weight stuff um, serving everyone. Uh, do you think that's here to stay or do you think it'll go back as soon as regulations permit? Well, I will, I will give you an example, which is not really from a professional person, but from uh, my parents-in-law. They were really happy when they could enjoy for the first time after the pandemic a normal buffet breakfast, as it was before, no assisted, no a la carte, just buffet breakfast, just with a pair of gloves and some gel. So they told me that was the best experience ever that they had after the pandemic. So people are looking forward to to go back as the buffet what is before, because it was as well uh, a sort of uh, something that you can find just in really nice hotels. Um, I think that uh, um, there are something related to the buffet that will come back uh, um, as it was before. It's something that we were already changing, like the uh, show cooking station uh, and uh, people explaining what we were producing and so on. So I remember that uh, in the Fairmont, for example, we have uh, most of our buffet offer it was as well with the show cooking station in order to be more interactive with, uh, with the guests as well. So I think that this part will stay um, yeah. because we like this uh, experience and as well this educational part of the gastronomic, uh, the, of the gastronomic experience. I don't think that the, the buffet will be uh, over because I saw already yeah. other colleagues already Going back to the buffet because it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's easier for uh, for the staff, it's easier for uh, for the guests, uh, and at the end of the day, they, um, if you um, just put in place some uh, minimal, let's say, um, safety uh, procedures, you can get uh, a nice buffet with the safety uh, condition as well. At the end of the day, everyone is going to the supermarket today. No one uh, is getting sick from going to the supermarket, and everyone is touching. The wagon of the supermarket everyone is searching the food on uh, on the display so uh, i think that sometimes we need to have a look as well outside of our hospitality world have a look at what other industries are doing and uh, maybe we were too much worried at the beginning regarding this i mean it's important to to be on the safe side to be conscious to adapt procedures but at the end of the day i think that we attract too much attention on the hospitality world in terms of uh, uh, be safe be safe be safe because we were safe we are still safe
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And also, um, we've seen people real emphasize quality. So this pandemic has made people um, appreciate quality even more. And, and we really don't think we're going back on that. So people have become more demanding, as you say, looking for educational opportunities, looking to learn more, le learning to interact. Um, and we, and they've also been experimenting at home. So, you know, all the, all the TikTok classes and master classes probably that um, Isabella's been holding, um, they've, they've changed how people view food even more. So we have a lot more foodies out there um, and wanting to share that knowledge as well. So um, I think that- yeah, regarding, regarding this topic, there's another comment uh, from the audience. Ricardo Colosier Fernandez is uh, joining us. Hi, Ricardo. And he's, uh, um, he's having an idea and he just puts it out there and says, um, why not take advantage from that? And I think he relates to when we talked about um, having like the digital, like the hybrid part of the, audi um, the attendees um, enjoying maybe some education from a chef while the others are on site eating. And he's asking why not take advantage from that and have the kitchen online with guests to the digital menu when in the restaurant or on the hotel TV channel. So I think he means like connecting them while they may be waiting for the food via um, a pad or a screen so they can connect with the kitchen stuff. And he wants to know what you think about that, if you think that would be making sense or add value. It depends from the restaurant. Yeah. Sorry. So, it's about <laughs> going, 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 but. <laughs> if I understand it correctly, then uh, this is indeed the part where some are enjoying the, the physical food at home and the others are joining the, the, the class with the chef. And uh, of course, this can be set up in a way that you could uh, dial yourself in and also let the questions go to the <coughs> chef who could answer. But are we doing it then for 200 guests or are we doing that for a smaller audience? Uh, so that also depends on the size, uh, if, I, if I do understand the question right. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. overall, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's again getting a connection to the chef is, is very valuable. Uh, people want to see the chef. They want to talk to the chef. And, <laughs> and, the chef? and, and how is the chef feeling about that? Because I mean, they yeah. <laughs> private kitchen, and if we put them on a channel now and they're being watched or like actually like asked to interact while they're doing what they usually do, how do they feel about that? It's like, that also depends on the chef. And I know that some <laughs> of our chefs would love it and some wouldn't like yeah. to do it at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like the idea actually to, I, I don't know, like imagine sitting in a restaurant, for example, and you're waiting and you, there is a, is a way you can kind of connect virtually with the person that's preparing your food right now and maybe even telling you something about it. Yeah. When you're physically in the kitchen. Um, I mean, there's, there's so many opportunities technology can give you to create an experience on top of the personal one you have in the restaurant. Yeah. So yeah. thank you for the idea, Ricardo. And I mean, we're, we're at uh, 55 minutes now. We almost uh, cut yes. the hour. Already. Yeah. Uh, I know there's many more topics, but um, what do you think? Shall we round off? And um, yeah, Rita, what would you say? Yeah. I was just looking at Claudia's comment in Italy with yes. the regulated, with the, the Green Pass mandatory, and of course, limited number of people or a certain number of outside. So um, I think this is common in, in many countries that um, we just have to follow this and there's really not much we can do about it. Of course, it makes planning a, a total headache because you don't know what you're going to have in, in six months' time. But um, again, our lead times at Great Hotels of the World have really, um, you know, they're, they're shot to pieces. We have some very, very short-term events almost for tomorrow. And then on the other hand, we've got 22, 23 and really nothing in between. So you can see that clearly people are still navigating um, in uncertainty. And, you know, I think the teams are doing an incredible job in every single hotel because obviously they've been great, greatly reduced and they're working around the clock um, with whatever business is out there. But as Isabel was, was saying, it's a lot about qualifying the opportunity. Um, so I think that's, a, that's another way that technology could help us. Um, reduce the, the back and forth and all the manual side to it, definitely in groups. So, yes, I think, um, yes, I think, Leah, we've, we've wrapped up our topic for now. Isabel, Angelo, and Michael, is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything we haven't covered? 
Well, something I'd love to hear actually, because I mean, the, the, the head, like the, the, the headline of our session was technology, F and B, and events, right? So, um, from each of you, what is, is there like three areas where you say um, you can't ignore that for the next six to twelve months? You really have to watch it and see how development is in terms of technology and your department. Is there is there specific areas you would highlight, and maybe also as an advice to your colleagues listening to the session? Michael, from your when you when you talk to your customers, what would you say for the midterm period coming? What not to neglect? Don't don't neglect the future. Demand is going to come back, right? So um, you need to you need to be in a position to drive business. So this whole story, and, and we just said it before. PDFs PDFs are great, but you want to click twenty five times to look at twenty five menus. No, you want one click, one touch to be able to view all the menus, um, and and those things. Uh, produce content that is valuable and that will help your prospective guests, prospective customers understand the product and then do what is necessary to handle the day-to-day -day business uh, based on the type of the type of venues you have and don't try to fix, don't try to find a cookie cutter solution. Um, I know we have a couple of customers who switched who switched away from big systems they implemented some big connected systems for all of their venues and spent a lot of money. And they realized it wasn't really necessary. It's like giving a two-star restaurant uh, fancy digital menus with with lots of photos and where they can where they can order and print online without seeing wait staff. That simply doesn't make sense. So think very carefully about what is going to be sustainable in any case, and then just build out logically and incrementally. And 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 don't don't forget about ROI, right? And all of that. <laughs> no ROI, no fun. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say? What do you recommend? Well, I think overall, it, it truly is important to understand. Always ask the question: Does it add value? Does it add value to eat? Uh, to to add that technology and technology can also go unnoticed. And I mean, I'm just talking about looking at efficiency. Uh, we have those uh, counters at our toilets, and uh, our director of housekeeping, they, she can see uh, how many people have visited that bathroom uh, within a certain period of time, and then she would send someone uh, most efficiently to go there. Uh, if we do. Look look at um, the possibility of QR codes uh, in the rooms. I think it's fantastic. It just helps us. If I look at a certain digital transformation that the Hotel Okura is going through right now, that will be another session that we can completely <laughs> uh, next time. Well, you're you're more than invited. <laughs> so welcome to come back <laughs> and talk uh, about Definitely. It. So uh, <laughs> I think we, we want to know our guests. We want to... Uh, we want them to be recognized. So if they have been on the conference floor, we want to do something very special for them the next morning for breakfast. But sometimes you work with five, six different systems that they don't communicate with each other. So end of the day, hey, this is where we need technology. Uh, and that's that's a big transformation um, that we are yeah. really focusing on in the future. Right. Angelo. I mean, uh, most of the points were already covered by Michael and by Isabella, but I have to say that I totally agree with uh, uh, the interconnection to the system, as Isabel said. And for me, um, at the end of the day, what we need to have a look when uh, digitalizing uh, um, our hotel or restaurant is to make sure that uh, is, uh, let's say, adding value for the guests in terms of personalization, make the life easier for our uh, staff as well, in order that they, be, they can be more focused on, uh, on the guest. And of course, uh, um, be uh, good tools for us to take faster decisions. So for me, the future could be to have a guest choosing the, uh, the plate or liking the plate in the digital menu. This information is saved in my CRM database so I can serve it better next time. Automatically, when I'm putting it in the system, uh, my debtor of finance will get the information about which plate I'm selling more and the inventory <laughs> management is going down with the count of this dish. And my supplier know already that I need this bottle of wine more on Monday because I sold it already. So for me, digitalization is to make it faster, to make it personalized for, uh, for the guests and to make really easy life for uh, the employee in the hospitality world. So yeah. looking forward to it. Yeah, I love that. That's, that's how it should be. The, yes. 
Cool. Yeah, and um, I mean, if, if you close this round, we will be back on 5th October with the next session. Um, but still, for everyone that was tuning in and there was maybe topics that we didn't address now in this round, feel free to reach out to Isabel, Angelo and Michael. I'm pretty sure they don't mind getting connection requests <laughs> and um, yeah, follow up with individual discussions. I mean, it's super interesting, right, to just ask people to actually work with this every day on a daily um, basis. And yeah, thank you guys for taking the time. Rita, is there anything you would like to add? Close this. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Michael, Angelo, for making this a great session. Thank you very much. And take to travel. Yeah, thank you. And I'm looking forward to hear in uh, half year time what you have to share then. Um, and if you still have some um, QR codes somewhere or if they all disappeared or if the menus are disappeared. So it's interesting to keep in touch about this. Yeah. Thank you all and have a nice evening or morning, day, wherever you tune in from. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye.